To begin our lecture, I'd like to introduce our group, uh, the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, through a video. Um, our Movement Disorder Center is one of uh, many of our centers of excellence, so we provide cutting edge, minimally invasive treatments, as well as conduct breakthrough research and clinical trials to advance the care of patients with neurological and cranial disorders. So I'd like to play this video as an intro. We have come a long way. The neurosciences are exploding with progress. Pacific Neuroscience Institute is the embodiment of this collective momentum and at the forefront of providing groundbreaking therapies while working hard to create novel solutions for some of medicine's most daunting problems. Formed over a decade of progress, our expertise has grown. Our multidisciplinary team is now working together across seven centers of excellence, including Pacific Brain Tumor Center, Pituitary Disorders Center, Eye, Ear, and Skull Base Center, and our new Pacific Stroke and Aneurysm Center, Movement Disorders Center, Adult Hydrocephalus Center, and Facial Pain Center. Although the disorders our patients face are complex, our goals are simple. Targeted therapies that minimize collateral damage and rapidly restore and sustain quality of life. Here is a glimpse of what we are doing today. For patients with brain, skull base, and pituitary tumors, we are leading the way in breakthrough treatments, including endoscopic keyhole surgery, personalized genomic and immunotherapies, and stereotactic radiosurgery. For patients with acute stroke and cerebral aneurysms, our cutting-edge endovascular and microsurgical therapies are saving brain and saving lives. For patients with Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, tailored medical therapies and deep brain stimulation are restoring function and independence. I in no way imagined I would ever have a brain tumor. That was totally horrifying, and I do have to say, Dr. Kelly was so awesome in taking you down from uh, the, the heights of panic. I had three surgeries right in a row and the brain surgery was by far the easiest. I had a very quick recovery. I was out of the hospital in like three days. Through relentless searching, my wife and I, we discovered this minimally invasive technique called a supraorbital craniotomy, which was performed by Dr. Daniel Kelly in Santa Monica, California. So it wasn't just around the block, but you know, if, if Dr. Daniel Kelly would have been in China, I would have been in China. Two days after the surgery, I still remember my wife, she was right in front of me when they took the bandage off, and she's like, wow. She's like, you can't even see the incision. Recovery after the surgery, uh, the uh, vision started to recover fairly fast. Uh, already the first day, I noticed that the color vision in my uh, affected eye had gotten better. I'm very glad I uh, came here to LA to, to meet Dr. Uh, Griffiths and uh, Dr. Kraus. Dr. Kayseri wants to be involved in developing the cure for glioblastomas. It's really motivating and th this is the reason we're here is to find a cure for brain cancer and, and to give patients options that they would not otherwise have at any other place. And through our Neuroscience Research Center with the John Wayne Cancer Institute, we are conducting brain tumor translational research and clinical trials. We are also exploring new neuro-restorative treatments, including stem cell therapies for stroke and brain injury, vaccines for neurodegenerative diseases, and leading edge technologies such as transcranial magnetic stimulation and focused ultrasound for brain tumors and tremor. Through our fellowship training programs, we're also training the next generation of clinician scientists in neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, and other specialties. With joint fundraising support from St. John's Health Center Foundation and the PNI Foundation, we will further expand our efforts in research, fellowship training, and patient education. And where does this all happen? Right here at our award-winning Providence St. John's Health Center, the soon-to-be-completed PNI Clinic, and across our Providence Southern California affiliates. The neurosciences, one of the final frontiers in medicine. It's been an incredible journey, and we're just getting started. Help us make a difference. Join us. Join, Join us. us. Join us. Join us. Pacific Neuroscience Institute delivering personalized precision care today while innovating for tomorrow.
that note, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Melita Petrosian. She is a board certified neurologist and movement disorder specialist who focuses on multidisciplinary approach to movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease, essential tremors, gait disorders, dystonia, hemifacial spasms, restless leg syndrome, and ticket disorders. Her approach begins with appropriate diagnosis, utilizing the latest imaging, optimization of medical treatments, Botox injections when indicated, and coordination with physical, occupational, and speech therapists. She assesses patients for deep brain stimulation surgery and creates a custom, tailored program of DBS settings. She is a member of the American Academy of Neurology and Movement Disorder Society, she sees patients at Providence St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica and now Providence Little Company of Mary Medical Center in Torrance. Um, and without further ado, here's Dr. Petrosian. Thank you, Rachel. I just wanted to um, thank um, Rachel and um, the rest of the staff for um, putting on such an amazing um, program today. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us um, on this slightly rainy day. Um, is this the clicker? Yes, that's the clicker. Okay, thank you. So um, I am mostly going to be talking about Parkinson's disease, but we will hopefully get a little bit to essential tremor as well. Sorry, is this is this okay? Can people hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to start with an overview of um, what is Parkinson's disease. Um, we're going to talk about updates in the management of uh, what we call motor symptoms, um, as well as management of non-motor symptoms, and we're going to talk about exercise which any of you who know me know that I, I love to talk about exercise. Um, we go. Okay, so um, as many of you know, Parkinson's disease is a degenerative condition affecting the brain. It affects the deep part of the brain, um, which uh, we call the basal ganglia, but I like to call it the autopilot of the brain because it's the part of the brain that controls the automatic or sort of subconscious movements. So when somebody's getting up and walking and getting a glass of water and coming back and sitting down, they're not thinking about you know, how they're flexing their fingers or flexing and extending the legs in alternation. Um, they're thinking about more important things. Um, and so it's that deep part of the brain that's acting like a, an autopilot. And because that's the part of the brain that's affected, movements can become slower, um, um, smaller, the voice can become softer. Um, there's a stiffness of the limbs, which we call rigidity, um, as well as a tremor, which is present when the limbs are at rest, so it's called a rest tremor. Um, and um, the other um, common symptoms are balance problems and a host of non-motor issues that we can get into. Um, so traditionally, um, or sort of in an for many years, the uh, treatment of Parkinson's focused on the motor symptoms, the ones I described earlier, sl uh, slowness, stiffness, tremor, uh, balance, um, and kind of neglected the other aspects of Parkinson's disease, which are the non-motor symptoms which affect the quality of life, as well as the aspects of really emphasizing the importance of exercise, um, psychosocial well-being, emotional health, the three parts of the circle and more holistic care that we're, we're giving now. Um, so when we think about the motor symptoms and management, um, we think about what's happening in the brain to cause the slowness and the stiffness. And at essence, it's a, a limitation or a lack of uh, what's called a neurotransmitter, which is like a, a brain chemical that is involved in communication of, between the brain's uh, areas um, called dopamine. And um, that reduced amount of dopamine um, results in a... Um, you know, basically disarray in that motor circuitry. So the idea is to try to boost the amount of dopamine in the brain. That's a very simplistic way of thinking about it. Obviously, we know our brains are super interesting and make us who we are because they're more complicated than that. So there's actually a lot more going on than just boosting dopamine, and that's why it's not as simple as if somebody has a potassium deficiency, you can just give them, you can predict how much potassium they need and just give it, and it's always gonna be the right dose. So it makes it more complicated, um, but um, the simple idea is that dopamine um, is created uh, from the conversion of levodopa into dopamine, and then it acts on what's called a receptor. So the analogy there would be like, dopamine is a key and the dopamine receptor is the lock. Um, and then the dopamine is recycled. 
So it gets metabolized. And so then it gets recreated again. So there's always this recycling of our brain chemicals for all of our brain chemicals. Um, the way we can harness that to treat um, deficiencies of dopamine is by giving back levodopa um, in the form of carbidopa levodopa, which is um, also known as Cinemet, or Ritari. Um, we can give what's called a dopamine agonist, which is akin to a different key fitting the same lock. And that would be um, primipexol, which is Mirapex, ropinerol, which is Requip, retigotine, which is the nupropatch, and apomorphine. We can try to reduce the metabolism of the brain's natural dopamine by giving an MAOB inhibitor, such as rosagiline, which is azelect, selegiline, which is eldopril, and safinamide, which is a newer drug called Zidago. Or we can uh, reduce the metabolism of the levodopa, which is uh, known as intacapone, uh, with a COMT inhibitor, which is intacapone, which is what's in Stilevo and Comptin. What happens over the years of a person having Parkinson's is that um, as the years go by, the um, response to the levodopa changes. So initially, um, when somebody takes a dose, dose of levodopa, it, it boosts the dopamine, and then people go from feeling slow and stiff, tremor, um, to feeling better, less, less tremor, uh, less slow, less stiff. Um, when people feel like the medications have kicked in, we call that being on. When people feel like the medications have worn off or they haven't kicked in yet, we call that feeling off. Off might feel like being slow, stiff, stuck, frozen. Um, and as the years go by, or sometimes even earlier in the course, people may have a response to the levodopa of an abnormal involuntary movement called a dyskinesia. So that is kind of like what Michael J. Fox looks like if you've seen him on TV, a little bit wiggly, a little bit move, a little bit of a sort of an extra move. It might be the head or the trunk or the limbs. It might affect the voice or the gait. And that's something that's a little bit of an excessive movement that's not including the tremor. So uh, what we see here are sort of these three kind of states to be in of being off, on, or on with dyskinesias. And earlier in the course of the disease, people, you will usually stay in that good blue zone of being on without too much dyskinesias with taking the medication three times a day. But as the years go by, they may kind of swing more wildly and have more time either being off or on with dyskinesias and less time in that good on zone. And the amount of time it takes to get from the left half of the slide to the right half in a, a person with Parkinson's really varies from person to person. Um, and we'll get into that <coughs> here. These are the definitions of what we talked about. There's more understanding of uh, the non-motor fluctuations, um, uh, meaning that when people are feeling off, it doesn't necessarily only affect their motor symptoms. It can also cause um, things like nausea, anxiety, cognitively feeling slow. Um, and so in terms of um, this whole five-year thing, people often ask me, or they've read that at five years, the medication is going to stop working. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's not, it's really a misnomer. The reality is that that five-year number is um, just a, a, an outcome of, of how we do our statistics. We just looked at people who'd had Parkinson's, uh, excuse me, who'd been on levodopa for five years, and then we're looking at you know, what percentage of them have on-off fluctuations or dyskinesias. And at that point, about 50% of people experience dyskinesias, but only 20% of those found it bothersome. So 80% of people who have dyskinesias do not find them bothersome. And about 40% of people who um, at five years are experiencing on-off fluctuations. So it doesn't mean that it's going to quote unquote stop working or expire. It just means that um, at some point along the course of the condition, the responsiveness becomes more erratic. So currently, what do we do to, sorry, this is a lot of our, sorry for that. 
um, to to manage off time, to manage those times of day where the medication is not kicking in smoothly. Well, sort of the easy thing to do would be to just increase the frequency of the immediate release carbidopa levodopa. Um, unfortunately, that can sometimes translate into people taking the medication seven or eight times a day, which is a little ridiculous if you think about it. Um, we could uh, switch to a controlled release formulation, namely Ritari, um, which improves off time by about an hour. Um, we can add an MAOB inhibitor like risagiline to slow down the metabolism of the uh, dopamine itself. And when I say slow down, I don't mean, again, we're not talking about body metabolism or the gut or food or anything like that. We're just talking about that brain recycling I was telling you about earlier. So there is a new drug about this, uh, to do this called Zadago. It was FDA approved in March of last year. You may have heard about it. Um, it did improve on time by about one and a half hours compared to about half an hour in placebo. Um, it, as far as we know, it's functioning fairly similarly to the older MAOB inhibitors. Um, there are some differences in the way the drug is designed um, in terms of its selectivity, but we haven't been able to say that there's any clinical differences between using these three medications. Um, other than the cost. <laughs> um, there, uh, the other options would be adding a COMT inhibitor such as COMTAN um, that will, in, again, enhance the length of the levodopa. There's a, a medication that's most likely going to be FDA approved um, soon that's called Apicapone. Um, that's a once a day medication and we can look out for that in the future. Um, and then we could add a dopamine agonist uh, like, the, like I said, the um, pramipexil, ropinirol, reticotine, or epimorphine. Um, and um, there are some you know, risks involved with all of these in terms of potential side effects that we won't get into today. How do we manage dyskinesias? Um, mainly it's with either re reducing the dose of the lo levodopa if we can, or by adding amantadine, which um, works differently um, on the dopamine to kind of boost the, uh, sort of regulate the dopamine in a different way. Um, amantadine is the same antiviral medication that's been around for a long time. So um, this has been used in Parkinson's patients for quite some time, but we, we, call, we used it what we call off-label. That means it wasn't technically FDA approved for this purpose. So this, you guys have met, may have read in the news about the new drug or the only FDA approved drug for dyskinesias and that's because they took amantadine and they made it long acting. So instead of taking it twice or three times a day, it's taken once a day, but it's the same old amantadine. It's not um, anything actually different. Um, but it did, the new, the study did show that the long acting amantadine reduced dyskinesias by about 30%, increased on time by two and a half hours. And there's actually a new long acting Amanda Dean that just got FDA approved last month. So this is apparently a popular space. Um, in the future, we may see um, drugs that work differently than these, this, uh, the amantadine to actually reduce dyskinesia. So there's a lot of interest in figuring out how to regulate the glutamate and not just the dopamine to try to reduce dyskinesia or uh, perhaps even prevent the induction of dyskinesia. So that'll be interesting. Um, so then we move into non-oral formulations of levodopa. Because the gut is also affected in Parkinson's disease, the gut slows down, and the gut is where the levodopa is being absorbed, so it makes sense that if the gut is slowing down, then it takes longer for those drugs to kick in. Um, and so for some people, using um, a way to bypass the mouth uh, and the esophagus and get directly into the small intestine um, makes sense for them. So what Duopa is, is a intestinal gel. Um, and I know that sounds weird, but it's basically um, a cartridge that clicks into something that kind of looks like a Walkman, if you guys remember Walkman from like the 80s and 90s. Um, it, um, it, it's a 16 hour a day continuous infusion so that instead of having to take the medications every two or three hours, it's a, you know, you click it in in the morning and then you, you wear this uh, device outside um, and it gets connected to the small intestine um, via something called a PEJ tube. I don't want to use the word feeding tube because most people who are using Duopa don't use that device to, fe to have feeds. Um, it's, they're still eating their normal diet, it's just that they're getting the medication through, almost like if you could call it a port, if you will. 
the same benefit as levodopa, but it's a smoother concentration over the course of the day. There can be complications, including the tube malfunction, the tube could pull out, um, but usually that's only in the first couple weeks. There were some cases of neuropathy associated with it as well. Um, generally speaking, so this is FDA approved. It's been available for a few years now. Um, um, we, we, we'll offer this to our patients. We sometimes think of it as, as a good option for people who aren't good candidates for DBS. Um, there's some interesting things coming out in terms of non-oral formulations of levodopa. Um, it looks like the inhalable levodopa is going to be most likely FDA approved later this year. It just got submitted last month, so that's something that's being anticipated. Um, it's going to be called Imbresia, um, and it's basically oral levodopa. Um, it turns out the lungs actually have a good absorption for it. So again, bypassing that gut, which has slowed down, um, and getting a much more rapid onset, and it lasts about four hours in the studies. Um, it seemed to be well tolerated, some cough and upper respiratory infections, um, but um, of course these were restricted to patients who had no lung problems or asthma at, at the beginning. Um, there's most likely going to be a subcutaneous form of levodopa, which is going to be like a pump patch, kind of like a, almost like an insulin pump kind of thing. Um, where, again, it, the idea is to try to make it more even over the course of the day. Um, so that will uh, just um, finished a, a phase two trial, which is sort of an intermediary. So that's still a little bit ways to go in terms of whether it's going to be FDA approved or not. Um, there is a pump patch, um, excuse me, pen pump form of a dopamine agonist called ApoGo. Um, that is a, um, it's not related to morphine, although it has morphine in the same, it has nothing to do with morphine, um, but it's, it's more similar to the um, dopamine agonists uh, like uh, Premipexol and Rapinerol. So there are, of course, some side effects involved with those, um, but for people who can tolerate apomorphine, it reduced off time by about two and a half hours. Um, must be taken with an anti-nauseamid. So we're going to get into a little bit about you know how to manage, how to live well with Parkinson's disease. So one of the most important things is taking medications consistently. And the reason for that is that um, the um, fluctuations in the uh, brain levels of the levodopa are thought to predispose people to dyskinesias down the line. So it's a really good idea even for people who are early on and think that they can get away with taking the medication once or twice a day to still try to be really consistent with taking it three times a day so that the brain levels stay consistent. Um, so it's important to take the medication on an empty stomach, consistent times every day, um, and um, ways to manage that, because it's really hard. I have to confess, I'm a bad patient. I'm supposed to be taking something for five days, you know, and I, I missed two doses already. So I'm, you know, who am I to talk? <laughs> we all forget meds. So we just want to think about how can we help ourselves remember. So, um, uh, you know, there's medication sets, which can be filled once a week. That helps to verify whether or not a pill has been taken, but it's not going to be a reminder. That can be, you know, added to a medication alarm, which is available um, as a, um, you know, as a watch or on a smartphone. There's, you know, different apps that you can use or just set up recurring alarms um, that will not verify that the med has been taken if the patient silenced the alert without actually going and taking it. Because sometimes people can get sort of alarm fatigue, like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, snoozing through it and then not actually doing it. Um, and then when you want to get really for sure, um, if, for example, if there's a person who's on their own and, you know, you know, some a family members at work and wants to make sure that the med is being taken at the right hour, there's something called MedReady, which alerts them. Um, it kind of dispenses the pills up to four times a day. Um, and it has this really annoying sound if you don't take the pills out. <laughs> Um, and it actually will alert the family member or caregiver like via text message if the med hasn't been taken within a certain amount of time. Now when we say taken, it means you take the pills out of that little cartridge down there. So you could throw it on the ground or flush it away and nobody would know. But you know, these are all sort of imperfect ways to try to get around the, the trouble that all of us have with remembering to take meds on time. 
Um, so speaking of remembering, um, cognitive issues. So I want to emphasize when we start to get into the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, especially for those of you who know somebody or are somebody who has an earlier stage of a diagnosis, is not to be alarmed when you're reading about all these things. It doesn't happen to everybody. Everybody with Parkinson's sort of has a different um, way that they're experiencing their Parkinson's. So it's, it's really important to know what to be on the lookout for, but uh, to know what to talk about with your doctors, but not to sort of think of this as a, oh, this is all going to happen to me and it's all gonna be uniformly terrible. So some people with Parkinson's do develop cognitive problems and that can include trouble initially, not necessarily with memory per se, but with decision-making. They may become more mentally inflexible, same kind of, idea of like feeling physically slow, feeling mentally slow, or feeling physically tight and rigid and feeling mentally or emotionally tight and rigid. Um, people have described trouble with their, what was I thinking, what was that word I was gonna say? You know, I, you know it's gone, uh, it's floated away. Um, and sometimes there can be disorientation. So how to manage it? There are preventative strategies. Um, you'll hear me talk about exercise and I'll plug it in here. Um, cognitive exercise, I like to emphasize being um, interacting with other people, um, as opposed to, I mean, I think you know, there's some evidence for doing things like the Sudoku or the crossword puzzle or the brain games or Lumosity. Nice sense about Lumosity is it makes you good at Lumosity. I don't know that it necessarily translates into what people are, are, what's important to people, but I think that it's take amazing. class, um, you know, taking a class where you know, you're interacting with other adults, um, you know, where you're out um, and having to be called upon, those kinds of things, I think, um, are actually really a lot more stimulating. Um, so there are medications for cognitive issues. There's one that's FDA approved for uh, memory issues in Parkinson's called Exelon. It's available orally or as a patch. There's also off-label usage of the medications we use for Alzheimer's disease. Not that this is Alzheimer's disease, um, and those are called denepazil, uh, which is Aricept, or Mamantine, which is Amenda. Adaptive strategies, so, you know, it's, it's okay to start to need to take notes and rely on a calendar, um, you know, keeping objects in the same location each day, um, and cognitive therapy can be helpful. It's also helpful to break down tasks to, you know, um, things that are complex and just to sort of do one step at a time. And also to kind of let go of the illusion that we can multitask. People think that they can multitask, but in reality our brains are not designed to multitask. There's only one thing that's actually at the forefront of our attention and everything else is becoming automatic, like driving or what have you. So the reality is as we get older, even if we don't have Parkinson's, that gets harder to do. So you know, trying to just stop and focus on one thing at a time, especially if it's something important. So in terms of you know, what family members can keep in mind, um, it's helpful to have patience um, with response to questions, to understand the source of you know, mental rigidity or difficulty with decision making, and to give gentle reminders without challenging the patient. Emotional symptoms can include depression, um, sometimes people will think that's a situational thing. Oh, I'm sad because I have Parkinson's. Well, it's not necessarily that simple because it doesn't necessarily correlate with the severity of the Parkinson's. People could have a really mild form of Parkinson's but be severely depressed and vice versa. Um, and that's because um, you know mood is something that's also regulated by the dopamine system. So it's all part of the brain processing of emotions. So um, it's important to discuss with your doctor and to get treatment for these things. Anxiety, very common. And one thing that people don't know the word for often when they come in is the word apathy. I mean, obviously you guys have all heard the word, but when people, a lot of times when people, do, doctors ask about mood stuff, they ask about depression or anxiety, but really a lot of people are experiencing apathy. It's not that they're down or depressed, they just have low interest, low motivation. Like they might want to do X, Y, Z, but they just can't seem to get themselves to do that. And that's because dopamine is really important for motivation and that reward system. So that can be incredibly tricky to treat. Um, fatigue, very common, very challenging to treat. Um, so other, so how to manage, so psychotherapy, counseling, group sessions, support groups, you guys being here today, you know, whether or not you have Parkinson's, just being here with other people, supporting each other, this is a huge thing that you guys are doing, and again, I want you, I want you all to sort of pat yourself on the back for being here. 
um, medication. So antidepressants, um, there are sort of different flavors on them. They can, they can boost serotonin, nor norepinephrine, and dopamine to varying degrees. So sometimes so you want something that's more activating for somebody who's got really low fatigue, uh, or excuse me, low motivation and fatigue. So something like Prozac or Wellbutrin. Some people who are having more insomnia or anxiety might be better served by something that's more calming, like Paxil or Zoloft or Celexa Lexapro. And then some antidepressants improve specific symptoms, like Cymbalta for neuropathic pain or Buspirone for anxiety. Um, Remron can be helpful for people who have a low appetite and insomnia. Um, Getting into other behavioral symptoms, so um, impulse control disorders are important things for people to be aware of. Again, it's not incredibly common in the Parkinson's world, but if it does happen, it's important to know what's going on, especially for family members. So it can be mild, like what's called hobbyism or punding, where people seem to be just doing, um, impulse control implies that you know there's a compulsive behavior, sort of a, 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 um, a lack of a break on a behavior. So punding or hobbies is kind of like doing things that are kind of meaningless, sort of like almost like reorganizing or shuffling without actually having an ultimate goal. Um, gambling, shopping, eating inappropriately, inappropriate sexual behavior, alcohol and drug use, um, overdoing it with the dopamine itself, all of these have been uh, described. Um, and these can be really devastating for people's bank accounts and their family res uh, relationships when they do occur um, and often don't really have much to do with any prior inclination towards addictive behaviors. Um, they're much more common with the use of dopamine agonists like the Mirapex and Requip. Um, um, a little less common with the Nupro patch but can occur and they do also occur with other medications they can occur in people who don't have Parkinson's and are using the dopamine agonist safe for restless legs, um, but they may or may not be recognized by the patient because people think that I don't have a problem. I don't know, you know, it's, it's kind of a shift in the brain's ability to recognize that there's a problem. So it's important for family members to know. Um, treatment involves just stopping the offending medication, um, but some people can have a, there's a theoretical withdrawal syndrome of the dopamine agonist to be aware of. Disconnect from reality can occur, so um, this can range from something really mild like an illusion. So a misperception, meaning like seeing a shadow of something or mistaking something for some, um, something else like, um, you know, there's a, a snake here, but actually it's a microphone. Um, there can, you know, more in a more severe way, that can be hallucinations with or without insight. So seeing a person or a vague outline of a person or hearing murmurs, not necessarily, um, it's not the same as somebody who's suffering from, you know, say schizophrenia where they're hearing actual communication. Um, it's more vague, um, typically. Um, but um, they can also be tactile, it can be something that's being felt that's not there, that's much less common than the visual. Um, often people will recognize there's nothing there. They either will look or they'll know, you know, this is just, you know, a dinner party, but there's nobody here, I know that. Um, and so oftentimes it's not too bothersome to the patient, but of course it can become bothersome, um, and especially if there's lack of insight. Um, delusions refer to a fixed false belief, so um, this is something that often the patient will not recognize, but the family member will describe as, you know, um, you know, Mr. Doe thinks that I'm cheating on him, or they think that the mailman is stealing from them, or what have you, and, and it can be very challenging to move past that. Um, how to manage hallucinations is by improving light source and being sure that vision is being checked out, um, to sort of reorient or remind gently, but avoid arguing with the delusion, because it's not really gonna get you far. Um, and to make medication adjustments, sometimes these have to do with too much dopamine or, or, to, or the dopamine agonist. Um, <clears throat> Mantadine can also do it, so that may need to be stopped. Um, there is a new medication that um, um, has been around for about, I guess, two years now, um, called Nuplazid, which um, works for hallucinations and delusions without blocking the dopamine, so it doesn't cause any problems with the Parkinson's symptoms. Um, if it's severe, sometimes we do use the older antipsychotics, but that's kind of controversial. 
Sleep can be very commonly affected in Parkinson's, mainly insomnia, trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, trouble rolling over in bed, frequent urination, restless legs can impact the quality of the sleep as well. Um, but that can sometimes be related to iron deficiency, so that's important to check for. Um, rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder refers to when we dream, we normally have a paralyzed body, except for our eyes that are moving. So that's why it's called rapid eye movement sleep. In rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, REM sleep behavior disorder, um, the body is no longer paralyzed. So the body's moving, so people can act out their dreams, kicking, punching. They're often fairly violent dreams. Um, so it's often that the dreamer is being attacked or a family member is being attacked by something or someone. So there's often a lot of self-defense kind of happening with you know, kicking, punching, strangling, jumping out of bed, those kinds of things. So they can kind of set people up for injury um, if, if that occurs. This interestingly can actually predate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's by several years. And it's important to discuss with the doctor because there is treatment for it and there are safety concerns. A sleep study may be helpful to exclude sleep apnea as a cause of symptoms. Um, and um, Important things for sleep management are sleep hygiene, so making sure that the <clears throat> lights are out, um, the bed is for sleep, no TV or screen time two hours prior to bedtime. Cognitive behavioral therapy is incredibly effective for insomnia. Um, there's a couple of books I put in there. Um, restless legs can be treated with iron, uh, if, if the patient is iron deficient, with GABA type drugs and with dopamine agonists. REM sleep behavior disorder can be treated with melatonin or clonazepam. Often it's helpful to have a urologist um, see the patient if, if part of the problem is getting up six or seven times a night to go to the bathroom. Um, and then if the problem is feeling stiff or stuck in bed, um, maybe people need a, a nighttime dose of um, levodopa. Anxiety obviously can cause insomnia, so sometimes people will use trazodone or mirtazapine. I try to avoid sleeping medications because they tend to be habit forming and then stop working. So you're just stuck on them with the risk of side effects down the line without it actually becoming staying effective. Um, sleep apnea needs to be treated. Um, so the gut is also very commonly affected in Parkinson's, mainly with constipation. The stomach slows down too, as I was saying, so it takes longer for things to move, including food and medications. So people can feel earlier or bloated um, soon after, like after sort of half of the meal instead of the full meal. And that of course can re lead to weight loss, which isn't really a good thing. Um, people can develop trouble swallowing and there can be drooling, um, which um, is related to the reduced frequency of swallowing. So often I'll ask people to uh, confer with a gastroenterologist for evaluation. Um, important things to consider for um, gut issues are taking uh, the levodopa on empty stomach so it doesn't interact with food, um, which impairs the uh, absorption. Getting six or eight glasses of water a day, lots of green leafy vegetables, fiber intake. Um, managing swallowing issues with um, a swallowing evaluation and considering a what's called a dysphagia diet, which means could mean like thickened liquids, things like that, small bites and sips. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then there are, of course, um, it's really important to treat constipation. A lot of people feel like, oh, I have constipation, but it's no big deal. But it actually really is a, an important thing to manage for not just the um, health impacts of constipation, but also with making sure that the medications are coming, coming through in a you know, a smooth way to make sure that you're staying up on that. So, um, Colace, Miralax, Dolcolax as needed. Um, people may need prescription strength medications such as Linzess, which actually impacts gut motility. Um, and that's something that a gastroenterologist would write for. Um, treating delayed gastric emptying um, with um, things like erythromycin. Um, but it's important for uh, people to be aware not to take anything that would block dopamine, such as um, Reglam. And then drooling can be managed by using actually Botox injections, interestingly enough, um, into the salivary glands to reduce the formation of saliva. Or and when I say reduce, I don't mean, obviously, we don't cut it out entirely, but we just lower the amount of saliva and reduce the drooling. Um, urinary symptoms, very common. In men, it's a question of whether it's the prostate or, or um, 
Parkinson's, so I often ask patients to consult with a urologist or um, a urogynecologist for women, but it can cause you know, um, increased urination, increased urgency, inability to hold the bladder, um, and increased urinating at night, which is called nocturia. <clears throat> Um, I won't get into what to do here because I tend to just refer, but I do want to make sure people are aware that when they talk to their urologist or your gynecologist, that some of the um, medications used for urinary symptoms can cause side effects that are relevant to Parkinson's patients, such as the alpha blockers like um, Flomax is the most commonly used one, can lower the blood pressure when people stand up. So if somebody already has that problem, that's not a good idea. And if somebody has confusion or mild dementia, um, the anticholinergics can exacerbate that, so not a good idea. <clears throat> Orthostatic hypotension refers to blood pressure dropping when somebody stands up more than 20 points. It can occur about two to three minutes after standing and it can manifest with dizziness, lightheadedness, or even falling or fainting um, after getting started with walking. So we tend to manage this with compression stockings, again, lots of water, small frequent meals, as opposed to like smaller big meals where the blood rushes to the gut and doesn't get up to the brain. Um, and um, at night, keeping the head of bed up 30 degrees. There are three medications, one of which is newer, um, that can be used to boost the blood pressure. Um, exercise, yay, okay. Um, so <laughs> you guys are gonna have a really great exercise um, demonstration um, later today to you know, get, the, get, get you moving. Um, so there are so many benefits of exercise. Um, improved gait and balance, reduced freezing, reduced risk of falls, improved flexibility and rigidity, better energy, um, better sense of well-being, but actually improved working memory, decision-making from the cognitive perspective, um, concentration, attention is improved, better mood um, and anxiety, and better sleep. How? How does exercise do all these amazing things? I always feel like I'm selling snake oil when I'm talking about exercise because there's so many great things about it. Um, well, it seems like there's several things that exercise does. One thing it does is it helps make the neurons, the brain cells, more efficient at using the dopamine. Um, it can encourage the growth of blood vessels to improve blood flow to the brain. It can help the neurons make new connections um, to the other neurons, so those are called synapses. Um, it can improve what we call neuroplasticity, um, which is really a fantastic thing that people may not be aware of, which is that your brain can actually change even later in life based on the behavior of the person. So literally um, structural or, or biochemical brain changes that can occur based on the exercises that you do. So this is really empowering. If you don't remember anything else from what I said, remember this is that you do have a lot you can do if you emphasize that power of exercise. Um, I swear, I, still, I feel like a preacher up here. Like, <laughs> praise be the exercise. Um, so um, it can improve cardiovascular health. You know what's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. It can support the functioning of the immune system and reduce inflammation. Of course, there are side effects with everything, so maybe aches and pains, that kind of thing. So we'll talk about um, cardiovascular um, exercise using things that are low impact or zero impact, like swimming, um, exercise bikes, uh, elliptical machines, where it's not going to be as hard on your joints as, say, like going for a walk or um, doing like, you know, I love the idea of water aerobics because you're buoyed in the water as opposed to doing something kind of high impact on the ground. Um, if you are cleared by your internist or cardiologist, high intensity cardiovascular activity was found to possibly delay the um, progression of Parkinson's, so that's really exciting. Stretching is really important to uh, counteract the rigidity that sets in, opening up, you know, and, and, we'll, and we'll go over that today. Resistance exercise I'll get into in the next slide. Um, balance training, walking, and then skill-based coordination. What do I mean by that? So the, you guys may have been reading about boxing for Parkinson's or dancing for Parkinson's, and what that does is it, it's not just the same old, same old getting on a bike and like kind of becoming mindless. Like I think it's happened to all of us where, you know, you're watching TV or you're like reading a magazine as you're exercising and you're not really paying attention to your body. You're not being mindful of what your body's doing. So when you're mindful, you're harnessing the fact that 
underlying the Parkinson's, your muscles are still strong, your nerves are still good, so you actually do have that strength to do the big open movements. You just have to become conscious of it. So it's all about bringing conscious awareness to what you're doing. Um, so do what you enjoy, start small, make changes. It's never too late to start, but be safe and don't be too impatient to see results. So this is a, a slide about um, progressive resistance exercise, which is kind of a strengthening kind of program, like either with weights or bands. And what they did in this study was they divided people who'd had Parkinson's on average seven years and they um, divide them into two groups. One of them did a milder kind of, you know, gentler exercise program. The other one did a more strenuous program where they were increasing the amount of weights or reps or sets over the course of six months. And then they followed them out for two years. And they found that if you can kind of see in the slide, the dotted line is the milder program and the darker line is the um, progressive resistance exercise with a more intense program. And they found that not only were they better off than the other group, they were actually better off than their own baseline at the beginning of the study. And as you guys know, unfortunately, Parkinson's disease is a progressive disease. So the fact that they were better than when they started at two years is huge. Um, they also found that um, they actually need, they were stronger, they were more mobile, and they actually needed less medication over two years. So at least at the 18 month mark, that was significant. So they all needed more medication as the years went by, but there was less of an increase in the group that was doing progressive resistance exercise. So it's kind of like exercise is a drug. Um, I'm gonna skip this um, and just talk for a moment about essential tremor because I know that was on the agenda for today. This is actually essential tremor awareness month, March is. So um, as you guys are may be aware, it's much more common than Parkinson's disease, about eight times uh, than the people who have Parkinson's disease. Um, there unfortunately haven't been a lot of updates in the management of uh, medications for essential tremor. Um, the same ones that we've had for several years now, um, which mainly propranolol, which is a beta blocker, and primidone, which is an anti-seizure medication. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things in terms of devices and um, ways to manage or, or cope with essential tremor. Um, essential tremor, as opposed to Parkinson's, tends to affect both hands more symmetrically, tends to be more of what's called a postural or action tremor. So while we used to call it benign, um, it, some, it's, it does turn out that it can be very life-changing to have a tremor that gets in the way of one's daily activities. Um, so there, uh, the advances that have been made in essential tremor um, have been more on the surgical side as opposed to, unfortunately, on the medical side. So I'm going to stop here and let Dr. Langevin take over as he's our restorative neurosurgeon. Um, please do write your questions down and we'll have the question and answer uh, session at the end. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Petrosian. I'd like to, uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our second presenter. Dr. Langevin is a neurosurgeon at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, where he is the director of restorative neurosurgery. He completed his training at the University of California in Los Angeles, go Bruins. His primary clinical focus is the treatment of movement disorders using neuromodulation, such as deep brain stimulation. His main research focus is the application of the neuromodulation for neuropsychiatric disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder and concussion. And without further ado, Please welcome Dr. Langevin. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, so I wanted to thank, first of all, uh, everyone for being here today. Uh, you know, I think it means a lot to us, obviously, that um, uh, we have a group of patients and family members who are very engaged uh, to learn about uh, the illness and new treatment options. Uh, both in the scientific community, but also locally here uh, at Little Company of Mary. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Providence, Little Company of Mary, uh, to help us out putting the event together. Uh, I personally have been in the community, practicing in the community here for a little over one year, and I have to say that it's been an amazing experience working with uh, Providence uh, LCM over at Torrance, uh, building the program along with, with their help and uh, the support that they have provided um, I remember a time uh, Dr. Petrosen and I used to go uh, different events, either by the APDA uh, or the Parkinson Society, and meeting a group of patients, and maybe some of you were in those uh, events, 
And we were talking with patients, you know, I see what's important for them, what they're looking for uh, in a center specializing in movement disorder, whether it's essential tremor or uh, Parkinson's disease. And I have to say that the number one uh, thing that people are telling us is that, you know, you guys are doing great things uh, and there are a lot of good things happening on the west side, you know, at UCLA, Cedars, other groups, and you guys at St. John's. Uh, but what we really need is a group of doctors uh, who would like to come into our community to help us out. Uh, because, you know, we have movement disorder, and so it's hard for us to get around. And uh, furthermore, if you uh, get surgery, uh, then there's a lot of insecurity into uh, getting a treatment further away. Because what if there's a problem? What if there's an issue? Uh, or, you know, a simple troubleshooting may mean a long commute to get to your physician. And so, you know, over time we took that into consideration and then uh, sure enough, there was a huge opportunity for LCM. They were looking for a group of uh, surgeons interested into coming into this uh, community and building a program along with them. Uh, and Dr. Kelly, uh, who you saw earlier in the video from Pacific Neuroscience Institute, gave his full support. And so that's why uh, NARA group is building uh, different programs and Movement Disorder was one of the pioneer uh, programs to be built. Uh, in that new center. And, uh, you know, obviously they helped us out building uh, the surgical aspect of surgery as well as the medical aspect, so building clinics, uh, access to all the care that was available at St. John's, so we brought that over here. Uh, but they're going further. Uh, you know, I was impressed that um, uh, they will be building a ambulatory surgery center. Uh, and I saw, personally saw the design and, you know, I have to say that I was very impressed uh, that they, they made it very uh, patient-centric, so that they made it such that patients come in through the surgical center and uh, they essentially will only be inside one room uh, before or after any procedures. And so this will be a, a, a surgical center, uh, uh, multidisciplinary, uh, but neurosurgery will be well represented there. Uh, so it will bring uh, the movement disorder in that, in that center as well. Uh, and so today we'll, uh, I wanted to present some of the advancement that we have in our field of uh, DBS, so a lot, and I'm gonna try to move a little bit. And uh, the other thing I want to say is I saw a lot of people taking notes uh, or pictures, which I think is great, uh, but I just want to mention they have the videos there, so it makes it a little awkward for us, but the good thing is that uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube, and we're, get, we're gonna be providing the link for everyone. Yes, we so we're gonna be providing the link for everyone so that you, know, you don't need to worry too much about taking notes, and I know we're speaking really fast, uh, you know, part of it is we're excited about the program, uh, but uh, I'll try to slow down. Uh, the, the success to a program in movement disorder is really the team. Uh, obviously, I feel uh, really lucky that I get to work with uh, one of the best movement disorder neurologists that I've met. So Dr. Petrosian actually was trained uh, at uh, Harvard you know, Medical School in her fellowship, and so we're very pleased. Uh, when I got the opportunity to meet her and decide that she was going to be the neurologist uh, in my practice. Um, and uh, we also have two amazing nurse practitioners who are really uh, making it happen to, uh, for us. Uh, so Ra you've met Rachel Cruz and uh, Giselle, Giselle over in the back. So please, you know, uh, if you have a minute, uh, feel free to say hi, ask them any questions. Uh, so Giselle is running a support group, so she has a lot of experience working with uh, patients with Parkinson's disease and their family members. Uh, so today, uh, we will go over uh, DBS to try to demystify uh, what it means to have deep brain stimulation. We'll go over the indications, primarily Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. And finally, uh, the surgical techniques so that people have an overview uh, about you know, what we do in the operating room and how do we make it as easy as possible for the patient. Uh, so this slide shows uh, the main component of uh, DBS. So there are three, uh, three components. The electrode uh, that has to rest into a very precise location for the brain. And that location is dependent on the specific condition that brings you to have DBS, as well as the specific symptoms of that condition that you have. Uh, so that's what uh, Dr. Petrosian and I uh, put our heads together and then we decide the best target for every patient. Uh, the other component that's important is the uh, pulse generator, and so uh, that induces the electricity. That's a small current, but it's also a smart computer in that it, it has a lot of information inside. So like if there was any issues with the system, uh, how much time of usage the patient has had since the last interrogation, 
uh, and also allows us to really shape that electrical field around the electrode. Uh, and so that's, that's an area of active uh, research right now in the engineering part of the field. And the last component is the uh, extension wires. And so the, ent uh, the entire system is under the skin. So there's nothing really that shows, uh, obviously, on the outside. Uh, maybe a little profile uh, on, the, on the clavicle where you can see the, the device, but the entire implant is under the skin. Uh, and the extension wire, uh, what we look for is something that's flexible so that patients are not limited in their neck motion. And uh, so about a year or a year and a half ago, uh, this was the only slide that I would show in this presentation. Uh, but now there are more uh, implants. So the Medtronic DBS implant was the, uh, uh, the only one available since approximately 1997 when uh, the FDA approved the device for the use in uh, Parkinson disease. Uh, and so you can see the three components, the electrode, and note that there are four uh, electrode contacts. And uh, what the device does is that it allows us to shape uh, a circular or a teardrop shape electrical field uh, around any of those contacts or a combination of the contacts. And so that's the uh, pulse generator and I believe that Medtronic has uh, the actual generator there on their table in the back so if you're curious uh, uh, please go and check it out. Uh, but this is uh, I believe the fourth generation now since the initial release. Uh, so it's been a device that's been um, uh, very uh, safe, uh, very reliable for us so very little recalls or any issues. Uh, and the device has uh, MRI com uh, compatibility uh, from an FDA perspective. And finally, the, uh, pulse, the, the patient uh, physician programmer uh, is the computer that we use to interface uh, non-invasively with the device to adjust the current, interrogate the device, determine how much uh, life, uh, battery life uh, the device still has to go. And the one component that's not shown here is the patient programmer. Uh, which gives also some basic information to the patient so they can interrogate the device, see if they need to have the battery replaced soon, uh, and also make small adjustments or turn the device on and off if there was uh, any reason for doing that. Um, the second company that came on the market is uh, St. Jude, which was uh, recently acquired by Habit. Uh, and uh, so St. Jude is also uh, outside, so if you're interested, and you're curious about learning the device, and I think it's gonna become more and more important that uh, patients and the family members learn about a device prior to the implant, uh, because I believe that uh, the patients will need to be involved with that decision-making going forward, uh, because there's slight differences between uh, each device that could make it m to have m one device over another one more advantages for specific patients. Uh, so St. Jude, um, again, similar components, so the uh, electrode, uh, the pulse generator, and uh, you can see that the uh, interface with the device is uh, updated compared to the Medtronic system. So they are using Apple products, so the patient is receiving the uh, iPod, and the physicians are programming using the iPad. Um, and finally, uh, just a few months ago, Boston Scientific uh, now came out with their system, uh, again with the similar uh, components. Uh, the difference is that this piece here with essentially is the recharger uh, for the pulse generator. So their uh, iteration of the device comes in uh, solely as a rechargeable system. Uh, the other company that has recharge rechargeable technology is uh, Medtronic. Uh, the advantage of the St. Jude uh, is uh, what we call directional stimulation, which is uh, again an active area of research uh, in our field. And uh, so if you look at the hardware, uh, you can see again the four contacts, so one, two, three, and four. And the main difference is the two contacts in the middle have uh, this uh, area here of separation. And so what that does is that it creates three different units for that ring electrode. So now the physicians can not only control uh, all the four contacts independently, uh, but they can s select a subgroup uh, or sub aspect of the electrode. So you have e even more precise uh, modulation, basically, or electrical field shaping. Uh, and this slide uh, sort of shows what that would do. So imagine that you have here uh, on this area of the slide, so you have your electrode, and we're looking at the electrode inside that precise target. So in this case, imagine that this would be your target. Uh, this area that's called STN. 
And so you can see that the electrode is slightly uh, off-centered of that target. And so when you shape an electrical field in red, a uh, circular electrical field, there's a slight encroaching on adjacent uh, area of the brain. And so uh, oftentimes this could actually be desirable, uh, but if a patient has side effect or it's limiting how much electricity you can deliver to the electrode, using directional uh, stimulation or current steering, you can actually reshape the electrode uh, current away from that uh, target area. And so St. Jude is the first company com uh, coming out with uh, that technology. Uh, the other companies are catching up as well. And uh, you know, currently it's uh, uh, two of the, the four electrodes that uh, have the uh, subunits. But you know, just to give you an overview, I think that in the future what we're gonna have is potentially like 56 uh, different contacts printed onto a cylindrical electrode, so then uh, we're essentially going to have computers uh, doing the programming for us, so that we'll tell the computer, you know, this is our area of interest, and uh, please figure out, you know, the best current uh, to uh, stimulate that region. So I think it's an interesting time, it's a really an exciting time for us to be in that field because we're seeing now three different companies uh, with a very smart engineer uh, in the U.S. And so they're really trying to build uh, the device of the future and I think we'll see a lot of improvement going forward. Uh, and uh, I added this slide uh, again to reinforce the fact that I think it's gonna become more important for the family and for the patient uh, along with their physician to be involved with selecting a device. And so that's why today I ask uh, uh, both companies that we're currently using at Providence to come in and show the products to the patient uh, because I think that, you know, I want to start that movement of having people being interested with uh, the device because it's going to be implanted in the patient's body. So you have to, you have to know what you're getting, essentially. Uh, but some of the pointers uh, which I think are important, you know, to take into consideration when selecting a, a specific device is the familiarity of the programming physician. So meaning the neurologist is referring you to have surgery. Uh, which device are they familiar with using? So ideally, they would know all three devices, how to program them. Mm -hmm. But if they're only familiar with uh, one of those devices, uh, and you feel you know th this is a, a great physician and uh, treating you really well, know well about your disease, then uh, that's sort of a no-brainer. It's better to go with that device than to change doctor. Um, and other uh, things to consider is the need for recurrent MRI. Sorry, this uh, pointer is a little weak, but. The need for recurrent MRIs. Uh, so currently, uh, only Medtronic has the uh, MRI conditional approval, uh, in, uh, which, which means that you are able to undergo MRIs. You just need to have uh, specific equipment in the MRI machine. So most uh, recent MRI machines would, would qualify for that. So you just need to show the technician doing the MRI your cart of the Medtronic, and so they have specific protocols to use for that. Uh, so that uh, relates a lot to patients who, let's say, would have uh, chronic uh, spinal conditions or orthopedic conditions needed recurrent MRIs of extremities uh, or people who would have uh, uh, lesions like tumors that need to have a follow-up with MRIs. So that's uh, something really to consider. We think that in the future, other company will seek uh, MRI conditional approval, but currently only Medtronic has it. Uh, another thing to consider is the need for a rechargeable system. Uh, so oftentimes people ask me how long uh, will the battery last? And it depends on how much electricity you need to control your, syst your, your symptoms. Uh, but on average, I'd say it's about three to five years. Uh, there are two rechargeable systems available on the market. Uh, one is from Medtronic, which is uh, nine years, right? Nine years, after which you need to have the battery replaced. Uh, the second one is Boston Scientific, which uh, I believe is 15 years, uh, so a different rechargeable technology. And so I think there's a lot of improvement uh, at that level. I'd say that sometimes uh, it's a little tricky for the patients uh, or the family to learn and remember to recharge a device. Uh, so we're hoping that the technology will continue to get easier and more user friendly. Uh, but right now, if someone uh, wants to have a rechargeable system, I recommend that they check uh, with the representative of the company ahead of the surgery to really see what the interface is gonna look like uh, so that they feel like they're comfortable recharging the system after the procedure is done. 
And uh, finally, the specific target or the condition being treated. And so that really refers to that directionality that I was showing. So, uh, so this applies more for certain targets where a higher level of precision is needed compared to other uh, targets. And uh, I will have to move uh, to the computer. Um, and so this is essentially what it's all about, uh, the improvement that we get with uh, DBS. And Rachel, I think there's, like, there's some sound in the video. Just make sure that we kill the sound because it's just uh, disrupting. Yeah, so uh, you see a patient uh, with a great amount of difficulty uh, getting out of the car. Uh, so with bradykinesia, rigidity, uh, slowness of movement. Um, and uh, so these, the cardinal symptoms of uh, Parkinson is really what's uh, targeted with the therapy. So the tremor, uh, the bradykinesia, or the rigidity, uh, and the slowness of movement. And so we see... The Yeah, sorry, uh, but uh, maybe we can just play it again because it was, uh, yeah. So we can see again the same uh, patient with more fluidity. You know, granted it's a different time of the day that the, the video is taken. Uh, but again, the, the goal of the therapy is to target uh, the, all the cardinal, the main symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, how does it work? Uh, that's a, a tricky question. Uh, the true answer is that we actually don't know. But in uh, the main theories in science is that we're inducing enough uh, noise in the neural system that uh, wherever we're putting that stimulation, the white noise, that area of the brain uh, becomes discounted, which is the equivalent of essentially destroying that area of the brain. Uh, so imagine that you have area A uh, speaking with area B, so two regions of the brain. And uh, normal language for area B for, uh, you know, so that it makes sense to area B would be the top here. Um, and so if there is a disease state like a Parkinson disease or a central tremor, you can imagine that there is a little bit of noise inside the system, in which case this, there's still in the background some signal that makes sense to B, but it's uh, very noisy and disrupting. So B, in order to do an interpretation of what A is trying to say, it takes a lot more time to decode it. And so that leads to what we believe are the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And uh, so because of that noise, it actually becomes disruptive to have A there in the background. So what we do in DBS is we put an electrode in uh, area A, and then we induce this white noise, which is a, a very high frequency signal uh, that is constant. And so B is then reading that signal, and they're saying like, this actually makes no sense. You know, there's no meaning to this signal. And so B just learns to forget uh, or to, to discount completely what A does. And so uh, in the case of uh, abnormal states such as essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, this actually leads to an improvement in symptoms because other areas of the brain that are still functioning normally can then carry their function without the disruption of the abnormal area. Uh, so with that said, uh, when we establish the, um, uh, the center you know, for excellence in movement disorder, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that the team is very important uh, to the success of the treatment. Uh, but from a patient perspective, uh, the factors that really determine the outcome of surgery, um, the number one is patient selection. So for us, it means really to select a neurologist uh, who's going to be able to work with your treating neurologist uh, in their two different expertise to make sure that you truly have the disease uh, either of Parkinson or essential tremor. So we know that you know, we know your conditions, we understand which sim symptoms are bothering you, and then we have uh, the knowledge that uh, the DBS is gonna be the right option for you. So, you know, we can do a surgery that's uh, marvelous with a perfect placement of the electrode, but if it's the wrong disease or the symptoms are not really addressable with DBS, then the patient is not going to be uh, happy. It's not going to be a successful outcome. So that's the number one. Uh, the second thing is really our job is to place the electrode in the right spot. So I said the electrode typically only uh, has a small current, and we think that it's only about two millimeters of uh, electricity around the electrode which means that if we're placing the electrode inaccurately about two to three millimeters, then really the efficacy uh, will drop significantly. And uh, finally, we team up with uh, our nurses in the hospital, as well as our nurse practitioners, uh, to address the issue of post-operative care. So we wanna make sure that the patients are getting back on their feet as soon as possible after the surgery, 
that they're receiving all their medications on time and that we're providing the support so that they can go back home and in the environment uh, as soon as possible to, to have a successful outcome. Uh, so the ideal candidate for uh, Parkinson disease will typically have uh, Parkinson disease for approximately five years. So the reason for that is because then we're comfortable that it's truly Parkinson disease that the patient is suffering from. So there could be conditions that are mimicking Parkinson, but typically those are uh, sooner and faster progressing. So over a course of five years, really, we have like a clear picture of where the symptoms are going and that the patient is truly suffering from Parkinson. Uh, another predictor of success is a great response to levodopa. Uh, somehow, although the levodopa and the DBS are working with different mechanism of action, the response to levodopa really predicts uh, a successful outcome with uh, DBS. So we are very worried if a patient had no benefit or very little benefit with levodopa. On occasion, we do have patients who have some benefits with levodopa, but are unable to tolerate the treatment because of side effects. So that, that's okay. Uh, but someone who had no benefit whatsoever with levodopa would actually be a negative uh, signal for us that DBS may not be the right uh, therapy. And we are also looking for patients typically with moderate severity. Uh, and there's actually, I believe I have a few slides on that, but there's actually a push now in the United States to try to move surgery a little earlier uh, and so the reason for that is that when the symptoms are too far advanced, uh, there's little benefit to the surgery. So the risks remain the same, uh, but the outcome is gonna be lessened because the disease is too far out. Uh, so the idea is to catch people in their early moderate phase, uh, so as they get the benefit of DBS early on in the course of their disease. And uh, so they, they maintain their level of activity through uh, the disease. So if um, the argument here is that uh, if somebody, someone has uh, current uh, work, so they're currently working still on the workforce, uh, or they have a specific hobby that they really enjoy, if we wait to do the surgery until they're no longer able to perform that, so they're out of the workforce, so they're stopped their hobby, it's very unlikely for us after the surgery, even if it's successful, to have them regain the capability to go back. So it's better uh, potentially to do the surgery beforehand to maintain uh, the functionality rather than trying to play catch up after the fact. Uh, we've shown this, fly, uh, this slide with uh, Dr. Petrosian, uh, but again, just to reiterate, uh, the whole purpose of uh, uh, medications and DBS and Parkinson's disease is uh, to maintain uh, motor function in a dark uh, blue zone uh, in this area. So that's a zone of uh, good control. And if you go above that, then you have too much movement. Uh, so like this kinesia. Uh, and if you go below that zone, then you have rigidity and slowness of movement. Uh, so the idea is that if you, uh, patients that have good response to medication initially, uh, can then go, go on to a phase where uh, the medication is good, but for a short period of time. So which we call uh, motor fluctuation. So they take a dose, uh, they're good for a while when it kicks in, but then it goes, it overshoots a little bit. Uh, so there's some disability related to the dyskinesia, and then it drops back to a normal zone. But uh, in between doses, there's a period of rigidity and slowness of movement. Um, the advantage of DBS is that it sort of acts as an equalizer because the stimulation is uh, consistently being delivered to that area of the brain. Uh, so imagine that you have that uh, constant therapy sort of acting in the background, and then your neurologist adjusts the medication on top of that. And so it doesn't get the patient that much better than their best on time, so the best time that they have while on medication. But the difference is that it keeps patients into that best optimal time for a longer period of time during the day. Uh, and so this is uh, the main study that had shown that uh, with a multi-center uh, trial in the United States. And the final uh, bottom line result is that in general, it added about four and a half hours of uh, optimal time for the patient. So whatever time is the, you know, in, during the day that you feel at your best from a motor perspective. So the, ide the ideal case is that we will maintain you four additional or four and a half additional hours at that uh, specific state throughout the day. 
symptoms that are typically not improved with Parkinson uh, with uh, DBS after Parkinson are typically the ones that affect what we call like the midline aspect of the body. Uh, so things such as uh, posture, uh, frequent falls, uh, drooling, and difficulty with eyelids. Uh, so falls actually um, or gait freezing can occasionally improve uh, slightly with DBS, uh, but it's definitely not. Uh, you know the uh, what we go for initially so we look more for uh, slowness of movement so if we think that bradykinesia is what causing gait freezing then it could improve uh, but oftentimes uh, this is multifactorial and uh, uh, in, in, in a number of cases it does not improve uh, so we really want to make sure again that the symptoms that are really causing the disability for the patients are the ones that we can address with uh, DBS so that's the patient selection portion uh, and so um, you can uh, you can actually run uh, this one is a video this one is just a picture uh, but I like to put that just to show a little bit what it means um, in uh, uh, in people's life to have four and a half hours in general what people tell us is that they can venture out of the house a little bit more than just on meds uh, so for this patient here he really enjoyed uh, skiing, but with only the meds, he was concerned that uh, the medication would wear off like either during uh, the time he was skiing or on top of the slope. And so he was feeling a little insecure about uh, going back skiing You know, once the diagnosis of Parkinson affected him. Uh, for this patient, it was surfing. Uh, but in the both cases, they felt that after the, park, the DBS was inserted, they felt that they had this uh, additional uh, four to five hours uh, per day where you know there was constant modulation inside the brain providing some symptomatic relief and it was just enough that they could uh, restart in this case their hobbies or maintain their hobbies uh, after the surgery and uh, again maybe I don't know if we can just disconnect the sound uh, this is for essential tremor and uh, it's actually uh, the, the, uh, the main slide that I put. You can actually run both videos simultaneously because uh, it's really helpful to see the difference. So on the left, the patient has the battery off and then he's turning the battery on now with the magnet. And uh, maybe Rachel, you can pause the DBS off video so that they can... Uh... Oh, and play them simultaneously? Well, it's just easier because you can compare uh, with the the uh, DBS therapy can do for tremor. Um, so in the case of essential tremor, it's, it's actually one of our best indications for deep brain stimulation. So the medication typically does not help uh, all that much, but the DBS has a drastic improvement on tremor. Uh, so in general, we say that, you know, 80% uh, tremor reduction for the majority of the patients. And the studies have shown that uh, the efficacy is maintained uh, over several years. And so, um, are you able to run the DBS off one? Yeah, so what we have again here is uh, the patient with the DBS off on the left side. And um, And so then you just turn the device on and you can see how much uh, uh, steadier you know, the, the arms are. And then uh, just give it a time to run through this one because uh, we have the patient, uh, and some of you may have been evaluated like that in the office. So we have the patient draw uh, spirals uh, to write their names uh, or a full sentence and to sign at the bottom. And so you can see a little bit the difference. And so for, you know, th this is, uh, uh, really basic activity of daily living that uh, those patients cannot perform uh, with essential tremor. Uh, a lot of patients tell us that they stop going to the restaurant because they cannot use uh, utensils very easily. Uh, some patients tell us that they have even problems signing checks, uh, you know, at the end of the month. Um, and so the, this therapy can really be transformative for those patients. And then uh, here, when we show the, um, here you can just pause it here. So that's the spiral without uh, DBS. And so this is the same patient on the same day uh, with the device just uh, started uh, acutely and then you can see uh, how legible you know, the writing is and then how uh, more accurate the spirals are. And then um, 
uh, yeah, you can run it a little longer because that shows, again, um, the ability to use utensils, ability to eat. And so and for those patients, unlike Parkinson's disease where we don't do that much better than meds, we just keep you longer period of time in a day. So we just control your symptoms for a longer period. In sexual tremor, we actually do a lot better than meds. Um, and the effect is maintained over uh, uh, many years. Uh, so that actually there's benefit throughout the life of the therapy. Uh, this was, uh, was what I was uh, re related to earlier about uh, doing DBS earlier. So that was a trial that was performed uh, in Europe. And you can see a large number of patients, at 250 patients done in Germany uh, and France. And so they uh, evaluated the difference between earlier DBS. So typically based on our criteria here in the United States. So they went a little bit more aggressive recruiting patients faster compared to best medical therapy. Um, and uh, the way you know the science is working here is that the feeling is that we've done DBS for a number of years, we've improved the surgical technique and reduced uh, the risk of the surgery. So now the science community is moving towards potentially pushing the envelope a little bit further and addressing the symptoms earlier in the state of the disease. Um, and so essentially, these are the characteristics of the patients, uh, but still uh, moderate, so uh, slightly, slightly. Um, milder form of uh, Parkinson's disease than what we're currently treating with um, uh, DBS. And uh, so these are like the bottom line results uh, in red being the improvement uh, compared to like the blue line, which is the medical therapy. So you can see how DBS really um, improved the outcome compared to best medical therapy in pretty much uh, all the aspects that were being measured in the trial. And uh, what, they what the authors mentioned is that they felt that cognition was something that typically does not improve uh, in uh, typical DBS, but potentially in earlier DBS. In this case, they saw some improvement. It's not entirely clear as to why that would occur. Uh, but I think what's most important is uh, the activity of daily living where there's uh, an improvement uh, compared to best medical therapy. And they felt that this was a little higher than what you would obtain with typical DBS insertion. Uh, so now shifting gear and talking about the surgery, uh, and uh, so as I said, uh, we are really focused on the accuracy of the electrode placement during the surgery. Uh, there are two strategies to, to get us there. Uh, so we don't place the electrode free-handed you know, in a precise spot, so we need to be guided uh, essentially to place the electrode. Traditionally, uh, it's uh, frame-based uh, techniques, and currently we have uh, newer technologies using frameless which uh, make the, uh, we believe, the surgery faster and more comfortable for the patient. Uh, so the frame uh, it looks like this here. You may have seen the device on the right side. Uh, so that's one of the most commonly used frame in the United States. Uh, these are the two ones that are essentially used uh, throughout the US, so the black one and the golden one. And they accomplish the same thing, so they do their job uh, very well. Uh, so the patient comes in and have uh, the frame placed uh, around the head and it's maintained uh, with four pins uh, basically attached to the skull. And so that essentially uh, creates a Cartesian plan around the patient's head and then we determine the precise target and then it delivers a XYZ coordinate and how to get there. Uh, the device that we're using at uh, Providence at Little Company Mary is this one here, uh, which is the frameless system. And in this case, um, what we do is we place those tiny uh, fiducials, and I have, uh, so this is a fiducial marker. So it looks like a tiny uh, screw, basically, so about four millimeters that we place into the patient's skull uh, about two weeks before the surgery. And so uh, this obviously goes under the skin and it's done in the clinic environment, uh, just using local anesthesia. Um, and uh, essentially these become the markers uh, to reference the skull in relation uh, to the patient scan. Uh, and they will act also as a um, foundation to hold uh, this 3D printed uh, device here in white. And so this then becomes the frame that guides uh, the electrode in place. So the advantage of that system, it's like you using uh, the classic stereotactic or you know, frame-based technology, but the main difference is that it's custom made for every single patient. Um, so the, uh, the production is pretty light, and uh, so for the patient it's easier uh, to have it installed during the surgery. 
And also the patient's head is not fixated to the surgical bed uh, during the surgery. So the patient can move uh, the neck slightly uh, to make sure that they are comfortable during the procedure. Uh, and the advantage is that the electrodes can be simultaneously installed uh, so, and there is no scanning done and no assembly of the, of the device done on the day of surgery. So the, in our experience, we really uh, shave approximately three hours of surgical time, uh, which, you know, that's, that's not for us, like we were there all day anyway. Uh, but for the patient, we, those three hours is really less anesthetics on board, uh, less pain, less discomfort. And we've noticed that it helps facilitate recovery post-operatively. Uh, so that's why we shifted into using uh, this device instead of frame base. As I said, we placed the uh, fiducials uh, two weeks before in the clinic. We then obtained a CT scan that we merged with the uh, previously obtained MRI of the same patient. And while the patient is at home, we then planned the entire surgery. So um, we have as much time as we want essentially during those two weeks to really plan a trajectory where we want the electrode to start, uh, where we want it to finish, and to make sure that the entire trajectory is safe for the patient. Once we determine that, we then send it to the company that uh, creates the, uh, the frame, um, and uh, uh, the equipment that is used to place the electrode is relatively streamlined and simple, so that uh, reduces the risk of infection. So if you have a lot of instruments on the table, and it takes longer to perform the surgery, so there's slightly more chance of having infections. So I like the fact that it's streamlined. Um, and uh, we use computer guidance, and so that's a step that's very similar uh, if you use a frame or no frame. But essentially, that's an improvement of the technology that we've seen uh, over the last 10 years where we have these computer-assisted guidance where we can really visualize the entire trajectory of the electrode through the brain uh, using the patient's MRI. And uh, what we look for here exact is uh, the exactitude of the target, as well as uh, the safety of the trajectory. So we want to make sure that we're far away from any important blood vessels uh, that can cause a complication. And at the end, the uh, uh, software generates a rendition, a 3D rendition of what the, uh, the uh, custom-made frame will look like uh, once installed. And so this is a mathematical system. So another thing that I like is that there's no measurement uh, during the surgery. So the, the computers uh, are measuring uh, everything based on the patient scans and uh, our predetermined uh, trajectory. So the, on the day of surgery, we only focus on the patient, the symptoms, the improvements that we have and the side effects. So we don't have to worry about measuring and making sure of, uh, we are accurate assembling the frame. And uh, make sure that, I think they put some music here, but I asked the company, uh, I was actually um, interested to know how they make, sorry about that, I don't know why they were, uh, they thought they were funny, but uh, so this is their, um, uh, their laser printer essentially uh, building the device in 3D. Sorry. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but essentially what they do is that it prints out uh, layer by layer, and at the end they have um, um, a block of powder and the device is like inside of it, so they just essentially brush off all the, uh, the dust and then uh, like an archaeologist and then they have the, uh, the device that comes out. So that's the, the, uh, the printout, layers by layers. And um, so it's a company that's located in Maine, so they, they print them out over there and then uh, ship, ship them uh, to us and then we sterilize the equipment. And so that's the, uh, a laser that etch out like every single layer, one after the other, and then another layer of powder is added uh, for the uh, for the next layer, essentially. And so at the end, you have this block of powder with the uh, the custom made uh, frame located in the middle, and the engineers of the company, uh, you know, confirm the measurement, the accuracy of the system, and then uh, once that's completed, then it's sent to the hospital. Uh, the uh, several centers in the United States are now using uh, the custom-made frame uh, and the accuracy uh, complication rates uh, has been verified and uh, the scientific literature is showing uh, the same results as using uh, a traditional frame. Uh, in my hands though I feel like uh, uh, we're actually potentially a little bit more accurate because we don't have the measurement problems again and since uh, it's more comfortable for the patient uh, and it's easier to insert the electrode. It seems that there's less unpredictability as to make sure that the electrode is going down the inten intended trajectory. Uh, 
The last step is for us to confirm the accuracy of the uh, electrode once it's placed. And uh, we do that with three different steps. Uh, we like to check the electrode in the awake state intraoperatively. Um, and this is why I mentioned the importance of the patient being comfortable during the surgery, because once the electrodes are in place, uh, we actually like to uh, attach them to an externalized generator and to trial it. Um, and this is what it looks like um, here. Uh, but essentially, the neurologist, and, uh, Dr. Petrosian, is in the operating room with us and uh, does a, a, a neurological examination while the uh, electrodes are in place. Um, and then we, uh, we try the electrode at different voltages, so we slowly increase the electrode. And we look for two things. We look for uh, benefits of the symptoms, like tremor and rigidity, and then we look for side effects. And so that gives us a therapeutic window as to when the, um, the benefits start and when the side effects start. So if we increase the energy high enough, everybody will have some side effects. So we just want to know at which point that will occur, and if we have a good uh, margin of safety to, um, uh, to use the, the device over a long period of time. Uh, and actually we do want to see a little bit of side effects because it tells us about the neighboring structures around the electrode. And uh, so that gives us an additional idea that we are in the correct spot, the intended uh, trajectory. Uh, another thing that we use is uh, uh, electrode recording. So like when the electrode is inserted inside the brain, uh, neurons are actually speaking to each other at different uh, rate of frequency. And so we can actually look at that signal and that tells us additional information as to when we enter our intended target and when we exit it. And so then we know the span um, uh, at which the electrode is uh, entering and exiting the, uh, the target. So we know how many contacts of the electrode we have inside our intended target. And lastly, uh, we do uh, always a CT scan postoperatively and that tells us a lot of information. So if there is any complications uh, like bleeding uh, or stroke, so we want to find out. Uh, and also, uh, it allows us to superimpose those images to the preoperative MRI, and then we can confirm that our electrode is indeed over the intended target. Uh, and briefly, to conclude, uh, things that we look for postoperatively, uh, so we want to rule out any immediate complications, so which are very low in uh, uh, DBS surgery nowadays. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we want to make sure that the patient receives uh, their Parkinson medication. So after the surgery for implantation of the electrode, uh, the device is not uh, in place yet. So typically we wait an additional week before uh, placing the device on an outpatient uh, surgery uh, center. And uh, so during that time, there's no therapy from uh, the DBS. So we need to make sure that the patient receives their medication on time uh, so they don't suffer from freezing, uh, gate freezing and uh, bradykinesia and, and rigidity that would slow down uh, their progress towards recovery. Uh, things that we look for are uh, signs of uh, strokes or hemorrhage, uh, as I mentioned, change in mental status or seizures. Uh, fortunately, all of those are extremely low risk uh, in DBS surgery, uh, so we're talking about 1% or less. Um, and the reason why the, those risks have reduced over time is because we spend a lot of time with the preoperative MRI planning our trajectory and making sure that we're away from any critical structures and we uh, work with the primary care provider and the patient's doctor to make sure that the blood pressure, diabetes and other conditions are treated properly before the surgery. Uh, and headache occurs uh, most of the time after the surgery but typically only lasts about two days. Uh, so we want to make sure by the time a patient goes home that uh, uh, that symptom is well controlled. Uh, so this is just a, a slide to reiterate the importance of medication. Uh, and so for this, we work uh, really closely with our pharmacists and our, and our nurses in the hospital. And finally, early mobilization. We aim for a discharge approximately one to two days to make sure that uh, there's less risk of having a hospital acquire uh, infection while in the, uh, in the hospital. So we prefer uh, as much as possible to have the patient return to their home environment what, uh, when that is, uh, can be safely achieved and that the patient is uh, comfortable um, with their symptoms. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, you know, I think it's an exciting time again. I think that there's gonna be, we're gonna see a lot of improvement with the device moving forward. We've already seen a lot of changes uh, over the last few years. And uh, 
uh, DBS can truly be transformative uh, for those patients suffering from severe tremor, uh, in the case of essential tremor, and for those patients with Parkinson's disease who have a lot of um, motor fluctuations. So in those cases, we've really heard from our patient stories uh, where you know they were able to maintain or even regain a lot of function going back to their hobbies. Um, and so on that, I think that now we're ready for the therapy session. Yeah. Okay, very good. So we had some interesting question. Um, first one, uh, if we get DBS now, uh, will we be excluded from future advances, uh, such as better leads and better system? So that's a great question. Uh, and there's two parts to, the, to answer that question. Uh, most of the systems actually have, um, uh, are built in so that they can be upgraded. Uh, so in a lot of cases, uh, people that have had, uh, for instance, Medtronic leads uh, several years ago, we are able to install the newer generator uh, for them. Uh, so the, a, a lot of time, the newer technologies that the uh, industry is building take into account the fact that uh, patients were implanted in, in the past, so they make the system compatible on occasion, it requires to have uh, an adapter. Uh, some uh, technology will will not carry over. Uh, so it's a little bit like, you know, when you have a computer and then you upgrade to the newer operating system. Uh, most of the time, you are allowed to upgrade to the new system. Occasionally, you have to change the entire hardware. Uh, so for instance, Boston Scientific already told us that uh, a new device uh, that they are expecting to come out in the next few years uh, will not be uh, backward compatible with the one that's available on the market today. Um, so that's uh, so that's something that uh, should be taken into account. You know when the patient decides about having uh, the device implanted and which one to select. Uh, that said, I, I, w I would like to say though that although we're expecting a lot of advances in the next uh, five years, uh, the uh, the field has already advanced quite a bit. You know in the last ten years. Uh, such that the device that we have today are like quite uh, better than what we had in the past. Uh, so I think that you know it's it's a it's a good time to consider the DBS. And the other, the other caveat to that is even with uh, directional leads and fancier type of programming, the science hasn't caught catch up yet. So we're not entirely sure if there's going to be a true clinical benefit to those technologies. So like we're still sorting it this out in different clinical trials. Uh, does DBS help Parkinson's tremor and cramping, uh, such as stiffness? So uh, yes, so uh, all the cardinal symptoms are improved, including uh, tremor, slowness of movement, rigidity, bradykinesia, and a dystonia, which is the cramping. So those uh, symptoms are improved. In general, uh, all the symptoms that are improved with uh, DOPA, L-DOPA, are also improved with uh, DBS. Do you still need meds even if you have DBS? For patients with essential tremor, typically uh, they're either off meds by the time they come to see us or uh, they will be off meds most likely after they're done with uh, DBS. Uh, in the case of Parkinson's disease, most patients will continue medication. Uh, in fact, uh, almost all patients will continue medication. Um, we tell patients that they can expect approximately a 20 to 30% reduction in meds postoperatively, either in frequency or dosage. Are you awake during the surgery? Uh, so, yeah, so we like to actually test the device intraoperatively to make sure that we have a good result. Uh, so we do that for every patient uh, who will be able to tolerate it. So that's why we shift to the frameless technology to make that step easier and more tolerable for the patient. Uh, that said, if someone has uh, uh, a lot of anxiety or a lot of pain uh, and are unable to complete that step, so we have done also the surgery completely asleep, but uh, our preference to confirm proper placement is to the surgery awake for that portion of the surgery that requires to be awake for the testing. Uh, how long is the full recovery after DBS uh, surgery? What about traveling? Uh, so. Um, I usually tell patients to expect about one month of convalescent in terms of your energy level because uh, you know you are undergoing anesthesia. There will be uh, at least two parts of the surgery, the uh, insertion of the electrode and then a week later the insertion of the generator which is a, less, uh, uh, a lesser deal than the uh, first surgery. Uh, but that said, I've noticed that it takes about you know a month for patients to really feel like you know now they're back to where they were uh, fully before the surgery. That said, we. Typically, uh, most of our patients go home 
one or two days after the surgery and so there they're able to uh, do their own activities and take care of themselves uh, but may just need a little help around the house carrying uh, groceries and helping with uh, uh, cooking and those kinds of things and in terms of traveling uh, so you receive uh, from the company a little card uh, that you put in your wallet so it's safe to travel typically we we like patients to wait about a month again so that we are con we confirm uh, that this, the wounds are healing well after the surgery. Uh, but following that, really, there's no restriction. Uh, when you go through the TSA, you have to show your cart, and then they use the, the paddle instead of having you go through the machine. Uh, but TSA has told us that they, they feel like eventually the, uh, the newer machine where you raise your arm, so they think that that one is going to be cleared with the device, uh, but not yet. Uh, does DBS help for uh, MSA, so multiple system atrophy? Uh, so unfortunately, it's not recommended to do DBS in that uh, condition, and that's one of the reasons why typically we like to wait about three to five years of diagnosis to rule out those conditions because the, really the, the benefits are not there uh, with mimickers of Parkinson's disease. So that's, that's why uh, we really spend a lot of time with our neurologists, and your current uh, treating neurologist is referring for surgery to make sure that we have the diagnosis down and uh, that's accurate. Thank you, Dr. Langevin. Now we're gonna go to Dr. Petrosian. Unfortunately, we have to cut the Q&A a little short. So um, if we don't get to your question, uh, Dr. Langevin and Dr. Petrosian will be here afterwards. Um, so we'll limit uh, questions for about 10, 15 minutes. Thank you, Rachel. Um, if there was a question that was given that was a little bit too specific, I won't get to that so, so that uh, questions are a little bit more broad for everyone's um, benefit. So uh, one question was about, is a CAT slash DAT scan essential? Um, and we didn't really talk about how do we make the diagnosis, so I wanna get into that now. So a DAT scan, D-A-T, is a dopamine transporter scan. It's a functional image as opposed to uh, just a picture of the brain. It gives us a sense of what the dopamine levels are in the brain. And it's not essential for patients where the diagnosis is otherwise pretty clear. Um, but for patients where it's unclear whether it's essential tremor or Parkinson's disease, it sort of has a kind of some gray area in between, um, it can be very helpful. Um, but for many patients where the diagnosis is pretty clear, it's not essential. An MRI is often done in patients who have Parkinson's disease to exclude other causes such as strokes or findings that might look more like um, the what we call atypical Parkinson's disorders like multiple system atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy. So if there are findings from the history or on the exam that are raising concern for those atypical conditions, then um, sometimes an MRI is required. Um, but unfortunately, an MRI cannot make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. It's really to just rule out other conditions. Um, questions about gut and nutrition. So um, people asked about if there's always constipation problems, should there be a daily regimen of Colis and Miralax? What kind of regimen should be followed if someone goes back and forth between constipation and diarrhea? Um, and I actually had a patient who coined the term constaria because uh, they were, you know, what would happen was rea realistically what was happening was that he was sort of letting a few days go without having a bowel movement and then he would take this and that and this and that and then you know what happens, you've got a large blockage and then the floodgates open and all of that stool that's been sitting higher up in the um, colon hasn't had a chance to have the water um, absorbed out or dried out essentially. So then what comes after that hard stuff is this diarrhea and then they would stop taking their constipation meds and then let a few more days go by and then get stopped up again getting this alternation between constipation and diarrhea. So the way to manage that is to take something mild every day. So if you are having a um, you know bowel movement um, every day or every other day is the goal. Um, so that you're not like, oh, I'm only gonna take something when I'm in pain or when I haven't gone for a few days. Um, some people will take a daily colase or a daily Miralax, but often people don't necessarily need that. It's not so much that you have to take something, it's just that you need to take whatever you need to get to that point of having a bowel movement daily or every other day um, without straining at it. So some people will use, you know, um, fiber, but what fiber does is it just bulks up the stool and it doesn't encourage motility of the gut. So it, people with Parkinson's may not respond to 
fiber. But Coley's is a stool softener and Miralax can encourage the gut to move. Um, and there's nothing wrong with taking it on a daily basis if necessary. Going back to the nutrition, um, that's a you know often a really important part of improving constipation. Lots of water, green leafy vegetables, you know the the fiber, natural fiber in the diet. Um, people asked about like what can you do in a nutritional way to improve dopamine per se. So fava beans was brought up. Um, people have also asked me or read about online about things like mucuna or you know natural eldopa drops. And I find that if you're going to take levodopa, take a dose of levodopa where we both know what you're getting so i don't find any point in um, these formulations where they're supposedly um, boosting dopamine um, i think that it's better to if you're going to need the medication use the medication and then from a nutritional perspective have a balanced diet um, and there isn't any proof of you know what kind of diet you absolutely should be having for parkinson's it hasn't been studied in that sense but there's been some research done in preventing alzheimer's in patients who have mild cognitive impairment so thinking about that being a neurodegenerative disease that has some parallel with parkinson's disease I like to recommend that diet, although it hasn't been proven to make a difference in Parkinson's. And what that diet is, is called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, you can look it up. Um, it's um, Mediterranean, essentially. It's green leafy vegetables, um, legumes, whole grains, uh, lean meats, um, fish, uh, nuts, berries, because berries have lots of antioxidants. Um, what am I forgetting, Giselle? Is she still here? I don't know. Um, and then avoiding red meats, processed foods, avoiding um, fried food, um, sweets. Um, and then this particular diet advises against cheese and butter, um, but um, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> literally, if you have low blood pressure. Um, and uh, then somebody else asked about does diet or nutrition affect the severity of essential tremor? There's no evidence that that would have any impact on that. Um, let me see, let me move these over. Um, going back to the, you know, sort of the, um, actually, let me skip that one. Um, okay, so now asking about what causes Parkinson's disease? So does a brain injury increase the chance of Parkinson's? There's some evidence that repetitive brain injuries might put somebody at risk of Parkinson's. So we think about, you know, Muhammad Ali, um, but that hasn't, that's a, that's a fairly atypical thing in terms of our patient's histories. Um, what par portion of familiar Parkinson's disease is estimated due to be due to DNA transmission? So I'm gonna sort of flip that and answer it in a different way, but the vast majority of people who have Parkinson's have no known family history. So about 85% of Parkinson's case cases have no family history. And yet, there is still a genetic play even in those uh, sporadic cases. And the theory is that there are genes that increase the risk of Parkinson's a small amount, but there are multiple of these genes. So they're kind of more like risk factors rather than a gene for Parkinson's per se. And then having that genetic predisposition, there has to be something in the environment that then goes on to trigger it. And we don't have that quite well understood yet, but some of the things we do know about in terms of environmental are pesticide exposure, manganese exposure like welders, um, when we say pesticide exposure, I mean, we're typically talking about farm workers who are doing the spraying. We're not talking about, oh, I had some apples that I didn't wash. That's not what we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, there's some interesting work done on caffeine intake and smoking actually reducing the risk, uh, or excuse me, being associated with a reduced risk of Parkinson's. That doesn't mean you should all go out and start smoking. Um, so the theory is that there's um, actually some antioxidants in nicotine and or could there be something, if you really go back in time, about the person who's genetically predisposed to getting Parkinson's that makes them more or less likely to, to smoke. So that idea of correlation is not causation. So it's not that one necessarily causes the other that we know of. Um, so genetically, you know, people who have a family history, or excuse me, people who have Parkinson's often worry about their children. Like, is this gonna, am I gonna pass this on to my kids? And yes, the risk might be increased in your family member. So it might be doubled or even tripled. But the risk of Parkinson's is about 1%. 
So if we double or triple the risk, that's 2% or 3%. So that means that, you know, say 97% chance they're not going to get Parkinson's. And yet I think that what's what we're going to find, the shift that we're going to see, hopefully very soon, is we're going to see better biomarkers. The DAT scan is one of them. Testing for REM sleep behavior disorder, testing for... Um, uh, smell deficiencies, testing for constipation. I think these are going to be some biomarkers that we're going to try to use to identify people who, let's say, have a family history who might be at risk of developing Parkinson's down the line. And then hopefully we're going to be able to do something to prevent that more than, you know, the usual like exercise, diet, yada, yada, but something that maybe will clear out that toxic protein, the toxic form of alpha-synuclein, maybe something that's going to be a quote-unquote vaccine. So I think this is really going to be a very interesting time in the next, um, hopefully, decade, um, hopefully less than a decade, I should say. Um, can stress increase um, Parkinson's cognitive problems adversely? Stress can really impact anybody who has a movement disorder, any kind of movement disorder. Basically, people have good days and bad days, and stress can certainly bring on the bad days, can, can make people have more cognitive complaints. Um, you know, when they're, somebody's on feeling like they're you know, being stared at, they might have more tremor. Um, but it's not something where it's ne that we necessarily think it's causing damage per se, but it's just sort of what engenders good days and bad days. Um, million dollar question, can Parkinson's cause death? So what is the relationship with Parkinson's and mortality? Well, we used to say it doesn't increase mortality, that it's just something you die with rather than dying of. That may not be entirely true, but it's generally the case that the majority of people who have Parkinson's, um, you know, if they are able to, you know, continue with a good medication regimen and exercise program, they can maintain their quality of life and live long enough that their, you know, cause of death isn't necessarily Parkinson's per se, but, you know, you know something medical. Um, but Parkinson's can put people at risk, unfortunately, in the advanced stages of, um, you know, if they're not moving well, if they're falling, risks with injuries, um, bed sores, things like that. So unfortunately, they're, you know, we don't want to sugarcoat the negative aspects of advanced Parkinson's. Questions about essential tremor being genetic. Um, yes, essential tremor is much more um, genetic. It's much more hereditary. There's a strong family history. Did I do that 10 minutes? No, come up? no? okay, I'm sorry. Um, and then this was actually a question for Dr. Langevin. Can the pulse generator be hacked? <laughs> so he said not yet. <laughs> um, okay, um, what are the similarities and differences between Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia? How is Lewy body dementia diagnosed? So Lewy body dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies is a form of atypical Parkinsonism that some people think of as two separate diseases and I like to think of it as along the spectrum of Parkinson's disease with dementia because it's the same, when we use that term Lewy body, we're talking about the um, little cells that we are little sort of dots if you will that we see on the brain and at autopsy and the main difference from an pathology perspective is just where are the Lewy bodies in Parkinson's disease they start in the, the as I said the basal ganglia and then they may over the decades spread to the rest of the brain whereas in Lewy body dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies rather it starts everywhere all at once so clinically the main difference is and realistically is just do, does the person have dementia before getting the motor symptoms or did they have motor symptoms for a few years and then they got dementia so I know it sounds kind of simplistic and that's why I think it's sort of the you know two two ends of a spectrum of the same disease two more minutes. thank you um, answered that is there a reason a specific reason for the tremor to occur only on the right and not both hands also head and neck question mark um, so it's incredibly common for Parkinson's disease to be asymmetric. That is to say, it'll start on one side of the body, and then often, unfortunately, over the years, it'll spread to the other side. But the difference will always be there, like more noticeable on one side than the left. Why that happens is a little unclear, but it just seems to be that um, one half of the 
substantia nigra, which is where the dopamine producing cells are, starts to degenerate before the other. I don't really know why, but it's very clear that essential tremor is more symmetric and Parkinson's is more asymmetric, but that's just the textbook. Textbook, excuse me. Um, if somebody had with essential tremor had a stroke previously, are they at greater risk or can they not have DBS? It depends on where the stroke is. Um, is, this, is essential tremor the same as intermittent tremor associated with being nervous or anxiety when speaking in front of an audience or group situation? No. But uh, people who have essential tremor, it may be exacerbated when being nervous and anxious or speaking in front of an audience. Um, defining essential tremor, what causes it, its progression, prognosis, and treatments. So essential tremor is a brain condition. It's a degenerative condition where the tremor generator of the brain, which is in the deep part called a, a, a little part of the thalamus, which is this deep part of the brain, um, it creates this rhythm of the brain, just like almost like a pacemaker of your heart. And naturally, other parts of the brain, namely the cerebellum, which is the, the bottom part down here, kind of sub, uh, suppresses that tremor generating or that rhythm generating activity. But for unclear reasons, there's this generation of the cerebellum and that no longer happens. So that tremor generator starts to act up. Um, it's a very long and slow progression. That's what we used to call it benign. Um, but it can take decades before it's interfering with somebody's, qual uh, with somebody's ability to do their daily living unless they're you know, a dentist or a neurosurgeon or something like that. Um, am I done? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to cut it a little short. But they're, they're going to be here after the lecture. So um, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, rehabilitation team at Providence who will guide us through a treatment plan uh, developed specifically to address the unique movement impairments for people with Parkinson's. So it's part of our big and loud program here at Little Company Torrance in San Pedro. So I'd like to introduce Brenda Chan, uh, who's a physical therapist, and Laura Wolseley, occupational therapists who are both certified LSVT big practitioners and they both work at Little Company um, here in Torrance. So I'll leave it, uh, the mic to them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for staying for some exercise. I want to um, just thank the doctors again for some excellent lectures and information and can you hear me okay okay because I'm more of a therapist than a public speaker but I'm gonna do it I'm Brenda Chan and I'm the physical therapist and you can't hear me Laura I'm Brenda Chan I'm the physical therapist at Torrance Outpatient Rehab Center and Laura Woolsey is our occupational therapist and both of us have been practicing the exercise program which is called LSVT Big for seven years and with great success in Torrance. We also, um, Providence offers the same program from certified uh, practitioners, certified therapists in San Pedro. And we also have a certified speech therapist to teach the LOUD program which is addressing your voice uh, exercises and improving your voice. So the quality of the program is based on global research and evidence. And just FYI, there's flyers about the program for both San Pedro and Torrance. I have some here and also on the table on the right as you walk out with a prescription on the back because this is a kind of program that is taught one-on-one, -on -one, highly intensely, insurance covered because it's so beneficial and it's so well proven to help your symptoms of movement with Parkinson's. It's a worldwide program as well. So Laura and I have been doing it with great success in Torrance. The basis of the program, I really want to um, thank Dr. Petrosian for mentioning neuroplasticity. Uh, the reason this program works so well is based on the principles of neuroplasticity, which means your brain and nervous system, movement system, is able to be impacted by what you do, not just medication. And so the program has specific exercises uh, addressing uh, the neuroplasticity or the way that your movement can be impacted by exercise just like a medication. Um, the three principles are high intensity. So you work really hard in the program and you work really hard when you do your exercises. 
um, frequency, you have to do it a lot. A lot of repetitions improve your brain and movement. And the main one is amplitude that we want our clients to remember and to focus on. Amplitude meaning you do it in a big way. The movements are done in a big way. And that's why they call it big. And that's why they call the speech program loud. So the, I think the main, besides us having great success and globally the program yielding great improvements for people, um, I think the main tip thing that think people don't realize about the big program and the loud program is it's not just a set of seven exercises and you just practice them every day. It's really uh, our one-on-one -on -one customizing the program to your needs and actually making functional movements into exercises. So we make sure as the therapist that you don't just learn exercises and do them well, but that you learn how to use those movements for everything you do. So we want to, to uh, demonstrate a couple of our typical exercises. And if you're comfortable and you can give yourself space, I want you to try them with us. The first one Laura and I are gonna demonstrate is uh, sitting, sustained sitting, uh, reaching and holding. And you'll notice that most of everything we do is really loud as well. So Laura's going to start by sitting and I'm, so you can see us, I'm going to pretend I'm sitting but I'm going to do the same exercise standing. So the exercise starts with, and again, please try this with us, spread out if you need to, okay? The exercise starts with you reach forward with big hands and fingers. Excellent. The next part of the stretch here is to bend down, not into any pain, bend down. You don't have to touch the floor. And then reach back up again and open your arms and hold right here for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And again, you're thinking big, okay? So we're gonna do it again. And as you're sitting, reach forward, big fingers, tall posture down to stretch, no pain at all. Reach up, open your arms, chest, and hold. One, two, three, four, awesome. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. I love it, 10, louder. And we always finish with a dramatic finish like this. Okay, we'll do two more. Start big, bend forward big, reach up big, open your arms big. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You could be louder. Ten. Good. Finish dramatically. I want to hear the loudest and biggest one this time. This is the last one. Reach, bend, stretch up. And again, I'm sitting. Pretend I'm sitting. Open. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Perfect. Finish dramatic. Excellent. That's one of the first exercises for big. The next exercise that we wanted to demonstrate, but we want you to be able to try it with us, is to have you, um, it's a standing exercise. So if you feel comfortable and you wanna try it, you can stand. If you're not comfortable standing, we can show you a sitting version, okay? By the way, everybody who's comfortable that just stood up, I wanna point out that there's a bigger way to stand up, which again is part of our program. And the bigger way looks like, not like this, that's small, right? But more like this. So that's an exercise. And I would like you to try it together with me. I want you to stand up as big as you can. Ready? And stand up big. Good. And I want you to feel the difference. Try it one more time. And stand up big and talk. Good. Excellent, I see the difference, and I mm -hmm. hope you feel the difference. So we're gonna do our standing exercise. Um, stepping and reaching. Now on this one, like say I wanna hold on, okay? If I feel uncomfortable, I wanna hold on, that's fine. Typically the exercise will look like this. You start tall, you step forward, and your arms come out, okay? So it's back to the beginning, and the arms come out when you step forward. Good. So if you want to hold your chair, it looks like this. So we'll do it together. If you want to sit, it can be done. We modify everything for whoever's 
whatever the needs are. It can be done like this. Okay, so if you're comfortable doing it sitting, do it sitting, okay? And let's do four on the right, and we have to be loud, four on the left. Starting with the right leg. Okay, so we're gonna do our left leg, so we're the mirror of you. You guys do your right leg. Ready, and step and reach. One, One. good. Four of them, two. two, good. Three, Three. yes. And four. four. Now try the other side. One. One. Awesome. We kind of stomp the feet. Two. Two. That makes it more big and dramatic. Three. Three. Yes. Awesome. You guys look great. Four. four. I love it. Perfect. So that's an example of one of our standing exercises. So Laura had a couple of ideas. I'll, I'll be Vanna over here now. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna use the mic because you can hear me better, right? So what I want you to, now that you're standing up, we're, part of those movements are important, so function. And in our clinic, we like to be friendly. So we want you to go, when you're out and about, actually anyone who's close to you, I want you to reach out and practice that reach and shake somebody's hand. Could be a family member and you're gonna look like this. Hello! And come back. <laughs> That's good. Let's do it again. We're friendly here. Hello. And back. So you get to practice your big reach. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Good. Okay. You guys are friendly. That's so nice. <laughs> so we're also going to practice now. That's a good one. So that's a function because many times our patients, they'll reach out very timidly and very small. And mm -hmm. then people take it like, oh, they don't like me. No, you do like them. You just want a big movement. And you get mm -hmm. to practice those. So what's good too now is um, what we work on, this is one of the other exercises, is it's rock and reach. So what I want you to do is like Brenda's going to demonstrate one foot in front of the other, what's anywhere, as long as it's in front. You and can hold the chair if you need to. If you're not steady, you hold the chair. Matter which foot, because we're going to make you switch anyway. Yes, but make it big. A little step where you're a little bit further than, you, but safe. And then what you're going to do is you're going to lean forward on the front foot, and then you're going to lean back. So you're going to rock. You're going to rock forward, and you're going you're to rock back. And then we're going to add the arms. You're going to reach forward and you're going to reach back and alternate. Forward, reach up high, big like you're reaching for the ceiling. Oh, and yes. forward and back. Wow. And forward and back. Good. Forward. Let's count to ten. One. One. Louder. Two. 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 Three. Three. Four. Four. Good. You look great. Five. Five. Hello, six. six, higher, really big, seven, rock and reach, eight, eight. two more, nine. nine, keep it big, ten, ten. excellent, nine. nice. Woo. Now, that is a really good one because when we walk with Parkinson's, we tend to do what? No arm swing. Mm -hmm. So this, this exercise really gets you to reach out, you get to say hello to people, and you actually walk with better balance. It's excellent. Excellent. You guys look great. <laughs> so I want to show you one more thing before we adjourn. We're kind of keeping it short, but I want you to see what it looks like to practice the walk. And again, from day one, if you come to our program, it's part of the, um, the standard is to practice not just standing up and uh, reaching and handshaking, but other functional things and everything, you know, based on we walk every day. So you have to practice the walk so that you can break through and walk more easily with better balance and more normal movements. So the walk might look funny and you're welcome to try it with us if you walk with us here or around the back. It looks exaggerated, but that's what we practice. If you have a walker, we walk big with the walker, but you practice like the biggest possible walk you can do. <laughs> doing this for a while. It doesn't have to be fast, but it does have to be big. Big. Yay. big. This is big. You will find this it is small. Very, this very is big. 
Yeah, I see people trying it. I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. If you have to hold the rail, we work it out so you get to practice a big walk. Any questions about the exercise program? Mm -hmm. Okay, question. Power up is the question. Um, she's familiar with the big and loud program from San Pedro and a new program. We have one of our therapists on board with this program. You'll read about it and hear about it. It's Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Program. It's like a progression off of big and offers more options and different positions. I have some papers with me with some of the exercises. So besides what we have several certified big therapists and loud therapists, we now are moving into the power zone. Sometimes when my patients come back to sort of recalibrate and get their tune-ups and make sure they're on track, I want them to learn more and have more opportunity for movement, which is power. Can you speak to when people tell me, oh, I already did PT? Can you point out, because you just said, you know, retune up and right, that, right. the importance of right, that. Right, right. Um, the physical therapy or occupational therapy aspect of this program is specific designed for movement for Parkinson's type symptoms. Power program also. And the fact is that even when our clients graduate, we want to recommend programs for them to do ongoing that promote the right kind of movement, challenge, intensity, and balance, such as what Reactive offers, and such as what we will offer in our uh, coming up this fall in our wellness clinic over by the glass building in Torrance. Mm -hmm. We want people to have more opportunities. So if you've been seen in the past for some therapy for Parkinson's but you've never learned the actual big program, you would benefit greatly from having this in your toolbox of things to help yourself with Parkinson's. Any other questions? Those are great questions by the way. Thank you, Brenda and Laura. Thank you all for coming. This concludes our lecture today. Uh, Dr. Petrosi and Dr. Langevin will stick around for another five, ten minutes if we can answer your questions. Please leave your evaluation forms on the table. And thank you all for coming. Thank you to our vendors for just participating. If you haven't checked out their booth, please do so. Have a good Saturday. Stay dry. Thank you.